Yeah. All right. Technical glitches taken care of. Little issues uh, handled and uh, a prayer needs to be offered and we will get started. Thanks for being here and being a part of things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be together um, for the technology that makes it easy for us to join, but yet still be able to learn from one another and to learn from your word. And so we just pray that you would be with us this evening as we do spend time around your word together, that our hearts would be open, that uh, we would learn more of you and be ready to learn even more uh, in the coming weeks as we talk about parables. I pray that uh, our time would be blessed by your presence, not just simply academic, but instead that the spirit of God would move within us. And we ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys. And uh, real quickly, let me go ahead and add in a couple of other people here. And let's begin here. The idea and uh, the concept here is the parables, grasping eternity. And tonight we're going to talk about the introduction to parables, but the, uh, the things that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks are some parables that you know. We'll talk about them. We'll talk about what they mean, but we'll also look at each one in the idea and the vein of how can we understand more about parables themselves. And so tonight, specifically, we're going to go deeper on the introduction to what parables are. We're going to look at the parables that are not of Jesus that are also in the scriptures. That is one of the pre-readings, the most famous Old Testament parable. Uh, if you did the pre-reading, you know. And uh, we're going to go from these different ones. We're going to tackle some great ones. I, I already know that we can do at least two um, parables, lessons, so to speak. But next week, we'll talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Then we'll talk about the parable of the sower, then the lost coin and the lost sheep, then the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, then we'll talk about the short stories, the, the parables of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And then we'll talk about the parent parable of the talents as we wrap up. So there is a seven-week course in front of us. Uh, after tonight, it'll only be six. I encourage you to be a part of each one if you can at all. It will be a blessing to you. You will learn and not just learn from each one of these parables individually, but also learn about these parables and how to know more about them um, as you read them. So tonight, especially as we go through this introduction, we'll talk about how to understand parables. And as we do the next week, it'll be a little easier to understand some of these very, very powerful stories that Jesus told uh, at, that we know as parables. Now, real quickly, let's talk about are they knowable or are they a complete mystery when it comes to parables? And I just want to mention to you, as always, I'm going to be coming from the U version. Uh, I'll be reading from that those passages of scripture in the U version. So you can follow along, you can read, you can listen. And also, I want to mention that I'm also going to be quoting and sharing some insights from the book called Parables by John MacArthur, The Mysteries of God's Kingdom Revealed Through the Stories that Jesus Told. And uh, this is available on Audible, and it's pretty good. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. If you do want to go deep, if you want to go uh, and, and kind of supplement the things that we're doing, you can do that. So exactly what is a parable anyway? Now, let me stop for a quick second. As you read this slide here, the answer has been a long, uh, around for a very long time, a definition that's simple and easy to remember. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. How many of you guys have ever heard of a parable being described as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning? Can I just see your hands real quick? Uh, a couple of you guys have seen or have heard that. Shelly, you better wave, uh, wave your hand and raise your hand because I've been preaching it and uh, I've been saying it. And if you're not paying attention enough to know that, then we got <laughs> other issues uh, in our marriage. Um, so very good. Teresa Guess, you see uh, your, your hand is up there. Yes, thank God. Do it on the screen. Don't do it in real life as you're driving and listening and not watching. Okay, so yes, is, this is something that we'll talk about and an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I'm going to be honest with you. John MacArthur has a nice, long, uh, very theological sounding uh, definition, but it really doesn't add that much to me. Uh, and I think it's a lot easier for us to hear uh, and remember 
a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, okay. it can be a lot more deep than that if you need it, but um, it's also as simple as it possibly can be. It's something that we understand on earth, and it's saying the kingdom of heaven is like this, or this is an important story for you to grasp the spiritual meaning, but let's put it in very earthly terms. And so that's all that a parable is, and it will be a help to you. It will be a good thing for you to understand that's what a parable is. And as we move forward, that'll be important, important as the definition. Now, from the book, Parables, that I mentioned a minute ago, John MacArthur quotes a liberal Bible scholar who wrote about the parables and whether or not we could interpret them. And this is what he said. It is the nature of a narrative to lend itself to the listener's imagination and become whatever the listener wants it to be. Despite the other narrator's intentions, parables work in any way that listeners want them to work. In spite of whatever Jesus may have intended with them, we simply do not understand how Jesus's parables uh, and clearly have no hope of ever discovering what his parables were in their intention. Interpreters of parables are not telling readers what Jesus meant with the parables. They simply do not and cannot know that. Had the interpreters been present in the audience when Jesus first spoke of the parable, the situation would have been no different. Thus, no right interpretation of the parables of Jesus ever existed. Huh. So the question in the heading here is, is a parable knowable? Or is it a complete mystery? And do you guys have uh, any kind of reaction to what this liberal Bible scholar said in these words? Do you believe that Jesus just told a, a story that had no point or meaning, that he wasn't trying to get across a specific point or meaning? Or do you think something very different? Let me just ask your personal opinion real quick. Anyone? I always looked at him that parables as uh, Christ breaking it down to a human level, a common, you know, without all the uh, deep $10 words and stuff. You know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so what you're talking about and hitting on there is the simplicity of the parables and the accessibility of the parables. We're going to talk more about that, actually, Leroy, for sure. What about anyone else? Does anybody else have a thought here? I mean, do you believe that interpreters of the parables are not telling what Jesus meant because nobody knows? Or do you think that it is knowable? Do you think uh, these are just simply cool stories? Or do you think that there's something that we can learn from them and take away from them? What do you think? You know, they were spoke of 2,000 years ago. Maybe those people understood them then better than we do today. I definitely think there's part of it. And actually, I'm going to mention one right, right now. The parable of the unmerciful servant talks about a, a servant who owed 10,000 talents and then one servant who owed 100 denarii. So if we don't understand what talents and what denarii are, um, then we do not grasp what that parable is really telling us. But I will say we can know those things. And because of that, I think there are things that Jesus was teaching that, as Leroy said, are simplified in many ways. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about how you can actually interpret a parable, because I'm going to be honest with you, I totally disagree with what this liberal scholar said. I don't believe that Jesus just said, here's a cool story. Um, <laughs> I think he had a purpose for it. I think he was teaching something, as Leroy said, um, something making it so simple that anybody could understand. Because let's be clear, Jesus was not there um, to impress people. He was there to transform and change their life, right? And so he was ready to meet them on the level that they were at. And public schools were not the same back then. Uh, there were many people in Jesus's audience who did not read nor write. And so he couldn't say, take home this pamphlet and remember it. But he could tell a story that they could remember and retell over and over and over again. And these kinds of stories 
became what we know now as parables. They're simple, memorable, and they're compact and takeable, you know, but there also is a point to each one. It's not just a random teaching. And let me just say, if you don't hear anything else, I say, I believe that you can know what a parable is. And I definitely believe that Jesus had a point. We may not know 1000% clarity, but I think we can get very, very, very close every single time to understanding what Jesus's parables mean, because Jesus did not put them out there to confuse us. He put them out there to clarify things for us. And Jesus always had a purpose for what he said. And so I think that's very important. Um, so why should we study the parables? Reason number one, the sheer scope of how many parables Jesus told. Uh, the Chara Project is a, uh, is a website that I found, and it says there are somewhere between 25 and 40. I went through the list, and I counted up on my little fingers uh, and toes uh, how many times huh. I looked at these stories, and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely a parable. That's not just a quick saying, but this is an actual story that I remember and all of that, there's 25 of those that I easily remember by the name. And so there's a lot going on there. And if you just say there's 25 stories that Jesus told that we have no clue what he meant, man, I think that that's waving a white flag and not being intellectually honest and is not really being honoring to Christ who didn't teach to confuse, but taught for absolute clarity as often as he possibly could. And so I think just the sheer scope there. Now, also, by the way, if you want to go a little deeper, you can go on that U version that I mentioned a little earlier. And here is a session seven seminary now called Understanding Parables. And so there's resources out there, whether it's articles like this Char project that I mentioned or this particular seminary now video. It's about 16 and a half minutes long, but uh, it may be worth uh, taking a look if you're wanting to go deeper on the parables. Now, Reason number two, some of the most famous and well-known teachings of Christ are parables. Their terminology is even known outside the church. It's made their its way into society at large. In other words, how many of you guys have ever heard of the Good Samaritan laws that we have on the books in the United States, right? You cannot be sued if you're trying to help somebody uh, in a very serious problem or, you know, like, let's just say you come upon an automobile accident and their car looks like it's about to burst into flames. It used to be that if you went over there and moved that person and uh, saved them from the flames, they could sue you because they you were moving them with a broken back, right? And so that they put laws on the books that said, listen, if the person's clear intent is to help somebody rather than to harm somebody, we're not going to let them be sued for something like that. So it's called a good Samaritan law. Well, why is it called a good Samaritan law? Because of the parable of the good Samaritan that we're going to talk about next week, right? It's a story of Jesus that's made its way into um, the common language, the concept of a prodigal son. Oh, the prodigal son has returned. Why do we talk about it in that way? It's because there's the prodigal son's parable. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. And then reason number three some of Jesus' most memorable teachings, the parable of the lost sheep, that parable of the prodigal son could easily be a two to three week sermon series. And it's so relatable that a child can understand it and remember it, but it's also so deep that you can keep going further and further and learning more and noticing more. So I hope you guys will be involved, especially as you, you know, look at it today, we're going to lay some groundwork today and then we're going to also move forward and, and apply some groundwork that we're using over the next couple of weeks. But I did ask you guys for some pre-reading. Maybe you read some of the scriptures. Maybe some of you guys read that. Did you notice that it was a parable, but it was in the Old Testament and it wasn't Jesus? Uh, we're going to talk more about that. But I'm asking for your favorites, your observations from the pre-reading. And so uh, now it's time to turn in your homework from 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, let me ask a quick quiz question, pop quiz question. What is the setting that is going on when this parable is told to, who? who's the parable told to real quickly? Who's that parable told to? You remember? Not a trick question. David. 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 David, David, that's right. So you guys are reading that, and I appreciate that very much. 
And so as you see, it's told to King David, what's the setting? Did a guy just show up and say, ah, I got a little story to tell you, or was there a very specific thing happening in chapter 11, just before chapter 12's parable? You guys remember? He committed adultery. Yes, absolutely. It's the, it's the time that he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then sent Uriah, her husband, into the fiercest part of the fighting basically killing him on purpose to cover up the fact that Bathsheba got pregnant while Uriah was gone and away. And uh, it's a long story. And you can go back and read chapter 11 and see uh, a man after God's been heart at his worst moment. But in second Samuel chapter 12, there's a parable told. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but did you guys have, a favorite part of this pre-reading that I shared or that I asked you guys to read. Do y'all have anything that really jumped out to you and was particularly important to you? Anyone? Time for me to drink. Time for you guys to talk. Um, I think I liked, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I'm trying to open my Bible up, but it's just close to me. <laughs> yes, I like, I like, um, Verse seven, and Nathan said to David, "Thou art the man." It's just like um, he, um, David was already passing judgments on, based on the parable, and Nathan just like called him out straight. Yes, that was you, you know. So that was really funny to me somehow. Yeah, if you can even put yourself, and and I talk about this, uh, how scripture starts to come alive if you can start seeing the pictures in your head. And so if you read this passage of scripture, can you just imagine this story being told and David gets mad and he's like so fired up that he says, this man deserves to die. And I can almost see just like a beat of time. And Nathan looks at him and just like almost points at him and says, you are that man. You're that man in the story that took away something that did not belong to you. And, and, and I mean, if you can see it, I mean, and if you could put yourself in Nathan's sandals for a minute, you're talking to the most powerful man in the world at that moment, right? David is the, the, the superpower ruler at that moment. And he points right in his chest and says, you're the one who did this terrible thing. You're the one who deserves to die. I mean, so it is a powerful moment. And Monica, that's a good one to choose from. I would always get in there first because, hey, you can get the best one. You can get the, the best fruit off the tree if you get in there first, right? So Monica, mm -hmm. I agree with you. This is like one of the most powerful parts of this story. And uh, it is an awesome moment for sure. Anyone else have something to say about that? Maybe that's your favorite as well. And you have an observation or a thought or something that happens in your mind, because by the way, what happens in my mind doesn't mean it's scriptural, but I can see it in my mind's eyes. So if you're, uh, if your mind's eyes telling you something different, I'd love to hear it. Anyone? Or another favorite. So in 11th the chapter, the verse ended with, the, but the thing uh, David had done displeased the Lord. Yeah. I was uh, thinking about it and uh, the man after God's own heart, how can he displease the Lord? He's the one who meditated upon the word of God morning and night when we, he was running for his life from Saul. Yeah. And uh, when he got an opportunity to kill Saul also two times, he never laid a hand on Saul himself. But this man, uh, after becoming king, and uh, the time where he has to be in the war with Ammonites, was resting himself in the palace, and his mind was, uh, I mean, the temptation that made him like this. And he went to an extent of murder and com uh, covering up his adultery and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt... Uh, God was grieving in his heart to see David like that. And never he got his consigned striking. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Though Uriah died and uh, Bathsheba cried, nothing actually touched his heart of his sin. Yeah. And God has to bring his prophet with the parable. And uh, though the parable was told to him, it was not straight to his heart. The sin was not straight to his heart. He was not at all putting himself there. Yeah. And when the word came strongly that you were the one i think then his eyes were open to his sin yeah it was a beautiful parable yeah. where uh, we as in- individuals also when it was told about someone else we will be right that should not be done that is very bad he has done like this we are the ones who will be you know like david judging yeah. but i feel on sunday when the pastor is uh, speaking on the pulpit it's better to think that this is i what he is speaking of mm-hmm. our heart should be ready for such a thing always getting prepared to listen mm-hmm. when nathan is speaking our our hearts consigned striken yeah that that's awesome kirthi i appreciate it and by the way uh i i noticed a little something uh similar to you you and your daughter uh on sunday you all both have a love of the word of god that that was probably and i i feel terrible about this because i really did do my best to preach a good message you know on easter sunday but the biggest blessing was seeing your daughter memorizing an entire chapter of scripture and sharing it and y'all don't have to say amen i already know it's true <laughs> you know mm-hmm. y'all tell me you also enjoyed the message that's great but sahanya was an awesome awesome blessing on sunday and uh the apple didn't fall far from the tree because I know you have a passion for the scriptures. And I love that. Um, and I, I should say that uh, these Bible studies from Corona time, from 2020, yeah, they are the ones which made me, you know, thirst and hunger for the word of God. Amen. I appreciate Amen. It. That's where it, uh, I really want to be here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And, I want to be honest with you. I have enjoyed, um, I love preaching um, and I love that, but I also really, really, really love doing these Bible studies and preparing them and that kind of thing. It's been an absolute blessing and uh, it's always been a blessing. And I, I talk to you guys all the time, you know, hey, Bible study crew, like you guys, y'all, I know the faces I'm going to see and I look forward to spending this time around God's word because I always learn from you guys. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for coming back one more time. And, uh, later, if you're watching, uh, you can always join us, but even if you're watching, I hope it continues to be a blessing. Um, Kirthi, I love what you were saying there. The thing that displeased the Lord did not really touch David's heart until he had some of the parable break down his defenses. And we're going to talk about that more, what the purposes of parables are. It's definitely found right there that we lose ourselves in a story and then it kind of turns on us and we're like, wait, I guess I am that man that stole that little lamb when I had plenty of my own, so to speak. And so there is something powerful about a parable Whereas if Nathan came and said, I want to tell you what you've done wrong, I don't think it would have, I think David would have listened because he is a man after God's own heart. But I think his repentance was absolute at this point because of the fact that he had lost himself emotionally. He had left himself wide open and unguarded and declared something with his emotions and then realized, I am that man. And then when that happened, the sledgehammer hit his heart uh, figuratively and just changed everything for him. And he's like, you're right. I I got no defense. And that is kind of the power of parables. And um, another kind of thing that happens later is when Jesus tells a parable, uh, they say that the chief priests were very angry because they perceived that he had spoken the parable against them that they were in the story and they realized, recognized it. So it's powerful. Um, Great stuff. Okay. So I tell you what, we're going to keep moving here because we, we have a lot of ground to cover, but as we cover this again later, 
jump in here. Tell me your favorite part of the parable as we move forward, because I do want to hear that. We just need to do that as we continue. So real quickly, the power and the purpose of parables, they're memorable, they're simple, and yet incredibly profound. Um, these are the things that we've already spoken, so I won't keep belaboring that point. But let me just say that they also hide the surprise. People lower their defenses, like we just talked about. And then it also hides ultimate truth until people are ready for it, because there is a judgment every time we take in the truth of God and do not respond to it. It hardens our heart a little bit. And we are drink, you know, kind of putting in judgment in our own lives for what we know, but yet will not do when it comes to God's word. And so more from the parables by John MacArthur, the more that his opponents heard Christ, the more truth they were accountable for, the more they hardened their hearts against the truth, the more severe their judgment would become. Thus, by teaching and concealing spiritual lessons in everyday stories and symbols, Jesus was keeping his opponents from piling guilt upon guilt on their own heads. And then he said, there are two sides of the same coin when Jesus spoke in parables. It hid the truth from people that thought they were too sophisticated and too educated to learn from an uneducated Jewish carpenter like Jesus. And then I kind of con consolidated on the second side. It fed and gave deep truths to other people who longed to understand God's truth but couldn't read or write those who may have been poorly educated because of economic status, but it was drawing the right people in and pushing the right kind of people to decide if they were in or out when it came to Jesus and who he was. So these are the purposes and the power of parables. And let's talk about the massive importance of parables. And I want you to pay special attention to the M-A-S-S, -S, the mass the massive importance of parables. So real quickly, here is how you can understand a parable. Every single parable can be understood. And I'm just going to tell you real quickly, we're going to do this every single time we go through a parable. We're going to talk about the M, the A, the S, and then that second S of each one of the parables. So let me tell you what the massive importance of parables and how you can understand them. First, get the main point. Second, get the audience. Third, get the setting. And then fourth, get the surprise of the parable. You guys see that? So real quickly, let's go through each one. The main point, look for one clear main truth. Assigning a deeper or hidden meaning to every single element can get it to where it's almost impossible to fully understand what Jesus is trying to say because you're lost in the weeds. So get the one main point. When we talk about the Good Samaritan next week, we're going to talk about the main point there is who is my neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor? He's talking about that. And as a matter of fact, that leads us to the audience. Whom Christ is speaking to gives the parable clarity. It often sheds great light on the main point of the parable. The audience is sometimes the followers of Christ. Sometimes he's addressing his opponents with parables. In that particular one of the Good Samaritan, there was a guy who asked him the question, wanting to justify himself, the man asked Jesus, well, who then is my neighbor? And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. A certain man left Jerusalem and went out and he was attacked by robbers and left on the side of the road. And then comes the parable of the Good Samaritan. You guys with me? Y'all y'all together with me? So yeah. see, the main point is, who is my neighbor? The audience of the parable tells us a little bit more about its point and what it's all about. Now, the setting of the parable, setting is where is Christ speaking? You know, what he, what is he doing? Is he answering a question? Is he teaching a larger audience? Is he speaking to one specific person? And then finally, the surprise of the parable. Look for any part of the story, character, action, a glaring element that would stand out to his original audience. The surprise often is the twist at the end of the story and often illuminates the main point. In the parable that we just talked about, let's talk about the parables that are not of Jesus. Let's talk about that real quickly. You see here in John chapter 4, verse 31, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat. 
In John 20, verse 16, after Jesus has been resurrected, Jesus says to her, Mary, and she turns and says to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher or rabbi in Aramaic. And then in Mark 10, 15, or 51, excuse me, even people that didn't follow Jesus called him rabbi. What do you want for me to, me to do for you, Jesus asks. And the blind man said to Jesus, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Let me see again. So Jewish rabbis often taught in parables. Jesus was not the first person to speak in parables. It was a teaching method of a Jewish rabbi, and Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He was a teacher of the spiritual truths and of the Old Testament to his followers. So we see this and we know this. We can also go back to this passage that we read, and we know that there is something there because it was a parable. It's all the way back with King David about a thousand years before Jesus was born, right? And so there is such a thing as a parable in the Old Testament. Other teachers did parables but nobody did him quite like Jesus. <laughs> so well, that's always the truth, right? That's always the truth. All right. Any questions, thoughts, or comments so far? Anyone? All right. Anyone? Well, I'm going to take a quick drink and I'm going to turn it over to Kirthi to read since we do not want Miss Teresa reading while she's driving that could end up very very poorly so i asked kirthi if she'd fill in kirthi if you'll just read these first uh few verses here from second samuel 12 and we do have time to hear from your favorite passages uh guys if you'd like to share so kirthi i'm going to turn it to you go right ahead nathan confronts david and the lord sent nathan to david he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord. Behold, I will rise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. 
Thank you, Kirthi. Wow, some powerful stuff here, you guys. Is there something that jumps out to you? Is this uh, passage that we've read, does this contain maybe your favorite passage or favorite part or something that jumps out to you specifically that you want to take a minute to talk about at this time? Anyone? Um, so I think in the Psalms, um, there's a particular verse that says that even though God loves us, um, uh, he still chastises us. Yeah. Despite the fact that God really loved David, because David was said to be the man, a man after God's heart. Yeah. Um, when he sinned, even though God forgave him, he still punished him. Yes. Um, that goes without saying that um every sin um every sin even though forgiven God is still gonna punish you but you know yeah yeah and, and I think that there is something powerful there what you're talking about is right Monica um you know the I think humanly speaking we know that it doesn't work this way but we would like for it to work this way where if we were really sorry then we would escape the consequences. The truth is, is that God can forgive us, but every time he forgives us does not mean that he eliminates the consequences. And, and I, I have a, a close friend who is a, a Bible study leader at our sister church, um, started uh, up in the Woodlands and Conroe area. Her name is Karen Ferguson. She used to be a part of our church before she moved up there to help her son start that church. Wonderful church, incredible lady, amazing Bible teacher. She used to say that you can choose your sin, but you do not get to choose the consequences of your sin. And I had never heard that before. I don't know if that's an original with her or not, but I will tell you, it is powerful to think about because the truth is, is that we do often choose our sin but we do not get to choose the consequences of that. And there is also a passage of scripture that says they have sown the wind and yet they reap the whirlwind. In other words, they've sown like a breeze or a, a blast of wind, but they've turned around and it's turned into a tornado as it's coming back on them. Um, and the truth is, is that that is so true. We choose those sins thinking that, well, the consequences won't be bad or God will forgive. And he does. He does forgive. But sometimes the consequences are dire. Sometimes they're huge. And sometimes the Lord takes them away. But most of the time, we still have to live with the consequences of the sins that we commit and choose to commit. Um, it's pretty powerful to think about. And um I, I think, Monica, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all off on a big, long tangent there, but you are right. God did love David. He was a man after God's own heart, and he did not change that because of David's great sin and the terrible things that he'd done. He still loved him, and he forgave him, and he was not punished, but he was punished. Um, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if you're like me, man. It'd be like, I'd rather die than see my kids punished. But um, this was a rough one for sure, for sure. And I would also say, well, I'll, I'll give you one more, uh, another chance or two to speak. If you guys have a favorite passage that you'd like to share or something observation from this passage that you'd like to kind of jump in on. Anyone? Donna, did I cut you off? It sounded like you might have started and then I kept yammering. So. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, sir. Good evening. I promise. This is promise. <laughs> yeah. What uh, resonates to me or, or touches me in the that passage is um, David accepted his sin mm. and yeah. with remorse. Yes. That's, he acknowledged that sin that he did and the remorse to repentance. And instantly God now say, you will not die again. You see, it's like God now forgive him, but he said the child will die. Yeah. 
And and it would have been easier for us to have this discussion if I didn't ask you to keep reading about what happened to the son. Or if I just stopped and said, you are the man. Woo, he got him with that parable. Off we go. But there's more to the story. But I think in the hard things that we're talking about with the son, you do have a tendency to miss what promise is saying. And I think that's a really good point, promise. David's repentance was full and it was immediate. And so was God's forgiveness, right? God's forgiveness was full and immediate in response to David's full and immediate repentance. And that is beautiful. Um, God doesn't say, oh yeah, we'll earn it. You know, he doesn't say it like that. He he says there's consequences, but but you've already got my full repent. You know, you've already got my full forgiveness and uh, I'm ready to move on. But it's good. Uh, it's a good prom promise. Uh, a good observation for sure. Good stuff. Anyone else? Another thing that jumped out to you? Won't tarry too long, but if you've got one more, anyone? I liked it in, um, I guess it's 11 and 12 where, you know, God says you did this in secret, but I'm going to expose it in, in the, the daylight, you know, where his neighbors are going to sleep with his in broad daylight. So even though David did it in secret or he thought he did it in secret, God's going to expose it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that also goes back again to what we were talking about, sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. Um, but I do think that is true. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus says, whatever is done in secret is going to be proclaimed from the rooftops. There's a passage of scripture that says, be sure your sins will find you out. The more we know about what God is warning us against, the more we ought to be aware that we just need to live for the long term, not in the moment, because the, the moment can, can lie to you <laughs> for sure. Um, but the consequences uh, and, and God's word will not lie. It does say that we will reap what we sow. And um, oftentimes it's worse. So, yeah, powerful stuff for sure. Okay, so let's read a little further. Let's read the rest of the story, so to speak. And let's see how David responds and how he reacts. And uh, let me just say one other thing. If you'll notice Yes, it is true that this child passes. This child dies. Don't let anybody ever say that what you are doing doesn't affect anybody else. Because the truth of the matter, I mean, all we're doing is lying to ourselves when we think, well, I'm doing this and it matters because it's me. And if I do something wrong, then I'll pay the consequences. It's like, no, let's be honest. You'll pay the consequences. Yes. But sometimes the consequences are even more disastrous for those behind us um, and those nearby to us. And so we got to be very careful that our consequences don't spill out on those that are closest to us. Um, and just be wise as we possibly can. So that's what I would just make a point of. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to Kirthi as we read kind of this difficult passage of scripture here as we see this. But let's talk about it uh, as well after we're done. Kirthi, if you don't mind. David's two children with Bathsheba. And the Lord afflicted the child with Uriah, that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself more harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together. David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. 
and he went into the house of the lord and worshiped he then went to his own house and when he asked they set food before him and he ate then his servant said to him what is this thing that you have done you fasted and wept for the child while he was alive but when the child died you rose and ate food he said while the child was still alive i fasted and wept for i said who knows whether the lord will be gracious to me that the child may live but now he is dead why should i fast can i bring him back again i shall go to him but he will not return to me then david comforted his wife bathsheba and went in to her and lay with her and she bore a son and he called his name solomon and the lord loved him and sent a message by nathan the prophet so he called his name jedidiah because of the lord and by the way jedidiah means loved by god so you can kind of see what's going on there all right same question as always what jumped out to you what what was it uh, and let me ask you a question can you see it in your mind's eye like when 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 they say david lay on the ground and the servants are over there whispering and david says is the child dead and they're like, we're not going to tell him We're, you know, can you start seeing it in your mind's eye? And then their faces just looking at David, like, what are you doing? You, you were mourning while the child was alive. Now that the child's dead, you're not in mourning anymore. What is that all about? But there's wisdom there, isn't there? He, he, he said, I was in mourning because I was fasting and praying that maybe the Lord might intervene and save him. But if that's not on you know the table anymore i'm not gonna dwell on the negative i'm gonna keep moving in my life it's powerful um hopefully you can see it in your mind's eye it's a very interesting conversation is there anything that jumps out to you guys in this passage or anything that you see Anyone? yes um 23 to 25 yes i was thinking because that david realized that he can't bring his son back and that he he probably he repented and God have forgiven. So now he now when he's went to his wife, he went to his wife as a husband, mm -hmm. as a real husband and not as an adulterer. Yeah. So now that he he has this, they have this son together. God loved the son because it's made out of the love that was meant to be, right. and not you know as a the adulterer that was before. Yeah. And, and I love this passage of scripture too, in that it reminds us that when we repent and move forward, God is not saying, Hey, but, but wait, I'm never going to approve of anything that Bathsheba does. You and Bathsheba, that whole thing is just a mess. No, he's already married her. They're already in a marriage relationship. It doesn't do any good to turn around and try to undo that again. So moving forward, God says, no, no, I, I love that child that came from your, your broken heartedness before me, the repentance, and now the moving forward in that strength. I, I agree, Donna. I think that's good. And, and I listen to this. David says, I shall go to him. In other words, I'm going to go and see my dead son. So that tells me that God had that child that died because of David's sin was already with God. He said, yeah. I'm going to go to where he is, but he's not going to turn around and come back to where I am. And so this tells us that that child is in eternity with the Lord. And as hard as it is for a child to pass, that was the norm in those days. There were women who died in childbirth at an alarming rate. There were child mortalities. It was just crazy. And uh, it's, it's a powerful thing, but it is also a thing that happened considerably more than we know uh, in our current and modern times. And so the Lord, the Lord goes forward as David does, as Bathsheba does as well. All right. Any other thoughts or anything that jumps out to you in this passage? Anyone? Yeah, you know, Pastor, the uh, David being 
called a man after God's own heart. Um, you know, when he was fasting, you know, he's, you know, the communication was going on between God and himself and the spirit. And uh, yep. God allowed him to see things and feel things and to realize things that uh, we don't normally feel. Yeah. You know, fasting is a interesting part they put in there that made it real to me. You know, it makes it, it, it helps me see it a little more clear how David felt after when the child passed, he had peace there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I just uh, I don't know. This whole this whole chapter has been great. Yeah, I, it's powerful. I get the, I get the pre notes. I didn't get to pre read anything, so I didn't want to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you this as well. Um, I love that David doesn't conform to tradition here. Tradition was that you don't fast and pray and mourn before the child dies. But then the moment that the child dies, you go into all these histrionics and hysterics. Yes. And David was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. If the Lord said he's going to take the child, he'll take the child. If I can change his mind by fasting and praying and communing and more repentance and all of that, then so be it. But if that's not the case, I'm not going to fall into this tradition and act like, you know, now I'm really, really sad when I was terribly sad and broken before. And uh, it's just a powerful thing uh, that David is his own man. He's his own man, blazing his own trail and doing what is right in God's sight, even though it's not right in the eyes of society. It's kind of interesting. Um, that kind of jumped out to me. All right. So let's do this and let's talk about it real quickly. As we bring this to a close, let's talk about the mass of this parable, like we talked about a little earlier. So here we are. What's the main point? Your verbiage doesn't have to be my verbiage either, but the story. What's the main point of the story that Nathan told in this parable? What is it? What's the main point here? Uh. You guys get ready now. I'm doing this every week with every parable. We're going to talk about the main point, then the audience, then the setting, then the surprise. Okay, so let's think about what is the main point. Let me let me give you, I'll give you this first one so we can move on to the second one and kind of see. But the main point of this story is a man in Israel stole something that wasn't his, right? That's the main point, right? There was a little you lamb that you know, existed and, and this rich man had all, you know, the main point was there's somebody in your kingdom that stole something that was not his and it's a big deal. And here's why. So that's the main point. Okay. So then who is the audience here? Who's the audience? There's only, is there many people, one person who's the audience? David, David, yeah, David, David, <laughs> this one person. There's mm -hmm. Nathan and King David. So the main point is somebody stole something that wasn't his. And I'm telling you and you alone. Okay. So what is the setting that we go on? What's the setting? Why, what are we seeing that's happening before this parable is told? What do we know happened? You remember? Yeah, uh, punishment. Okay. Punishment. Is David's affair and the cover up of that murder of Uriah? That's what it's what's all happening around it. Mm -hmm. So you see the mass here, the main point, the audience, the setting, and what's going on. And what is the surprise here? What's the surprise? I feel like it's wrapped up in that one phrase that he used. What was that surprise? It's you're the man. man. You're the man. All <laughs> Yeah, no, no, not you're the man. <laughs> you are that man. That's the surprise, right? Yeah. That's the surprise. And that's where David goes, what? Oh, you're right. I am that man. I do deserve to be punished, right? And so you see the mass here. You got the main point. Who's he talking to? What is the setting and what is the surprise? You are that man. 
when that happens, you know what the parable is about. And that's what I was trying to convey to you guys. Each week we'll do this. We'll talk about the main point, audience, setting, and surprise. And we'll talk about those things so we can get a sense of what each parable is truly about, what we can take away, what we can learn. And I promise you it'll get easier, but this is the tool that we're going to use so that you guys will know more and more about how these are, are going forward. All right. So real quickly, here's our recap, our homework, and our big takeaway. Let's hit these. First of all, Jesus told about 25 to 40 parables in his teaching ministry, at least 25 absolute minimum, and parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And then finally, all parables have mass to them. There's a main point, an audience, a setting, and a surprise, and usually these are the things that will teach us how to understand a parable. So next week, if you would, please read the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. It's only about 12 verses or so. So you can read it two or three times and really get a sense of it and maybe have something new jump out to you if you hear it a couple of extra times. But here's lessons one, lesson one's big takeaway to me. Fully understanding Jesus's parables mean you must understand par or Jesus's teachings means that you must understand parables because he told about 25 of them at least in his ministry. They're not unknowable. Instead, they are accessible. And the youngest child can find and understand Christ, learn lessons that are found in the parables. And even further, parables show how important God felt that it was that every single one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what our education level or any of those things, were able to grasp the eternal truth of the what Jesus was teaching. And so he made it accessible for all of us, no matter who we are. And so that shows us how important we are to the God who taught in parables. So that's why we're calling it grasping the eternal. And uh, I hope you guys will be with us next week as we go into uh, the Good Samaritan, as we go through the different ones, the different ones that we're going to study. We've got lots of interesting stuff to cover, and I hope you'll be here for each week. So thank you guys so much for being a part of things. May God bless you guys. Y'all have a good rest of the week, and uh, we're going to end right here. So y'all take care. God bless you, and I look All forward right. to you. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Bye, thank you, everyone. God bless you. <laughs> good night, everybody. Y'all take Bye, care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Oh, he's not at church. Huh? Maybe. He's not saying anything.